good to be with you again this week. I'm really excited about the lesson today because the Lord has released me to do a series on the book of Malachi, which is really an important book because when you, when you think about it, Malachi, most scholars agree, is the, the last prophet of the Old Testament. This was after the rebuilding of the temple. Uh, this was during the time when Nehemiah was charged with rebuilding the walls around Jerusalem. And it's very important because uh, it was like a, a, a last warning. You know, you would think that after uh, suffering 70 years of judgment in Babylon, and then the Lord graciously allowing you to return to your land and, and rebuild the temple, and now you've been given permission to even rebuild the walls, you would think that people would have, can I say, learned their lesson. Because, listen, the whole reason for the judgment, and we don't have time to get into that today, but for decades and decades and decades, God had been dealing with Israel, trying to get them to repent and return to the living God. And it, 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 was, it got so bad at one point, he said, but listen, they actually brought idols into the temple. I mean, idols to Baal, idols to, uh, they call them Ashtar poles, which today would, it's a phallic symbol. It's, anyway, it's, it's uh, everything, it's worse. He said to them at one point, he said, you have become worse than the heathen that I drove out in order to give you this land. You have become worse than them. And God doesn't exaggerate. If he says that they're worse, they had his people had become worse than the Canaanites and the Hittites and all the other ites that that uh, you know God's judgment drove you know drove them out, killed most of them, and to, in order to give the land to Israel. And now he says you have become worse than them. Well, God kept dealing with them for <laughs> decades and decades. You know first. Finally, the, the northern kingdom, the ten tribes in the north, they fell. And then about a hundred and some odd years later, it's, God was still dealing with Judah, the, the southern kingdom, for over a hundred years, trying to get them to repent. And there would be a good king come and they'd have somewhat of a revival, but then a bad king would be next and they'd go right back into their idol worship. And, I'll tell you what it reminds me of, to be honest with you, I hate to say this, I love America, I love the USA, but it reminds me of, of our, our nation here, that it's just a, a decline, just a steady decline, uh, at, at least over the last century and a half. Uh, just anyway, don't want to get into all that. There's, there's little revivals, little upticks, and that's what would happen in, in the, the land of Israel. They have a good king and he would tear down the idols and they'd have a revival while he was king, but then a bad king would come. But the overall trend was down, down, down. And then finally you've got, and then so they, they went into captivity. You know, Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar, that whole story for 70 years. Then God moves through a pagan, <laughs> he's, he prophesied about Cyrus about 150 years through Isaiah before Cyrus was even born, called him by name and said, you know, he was going to be his servant, even though he didn't know him. I mean, <laughs> Cyrus is not a believer, but still God used him to re start rebuilding things. So anyway, I can't go into all of that history. But now what's happened, just so you'll know about the prophet Malachi, Okay, the temple has been rebuilt. There was a long story there where there was opposition and there was a 16-year delay. And then finally through other prophets, which we, I don't have time to get into today, they finally finished rebuilding the temple. See, and that's, the temple is a type of salvation. That's the rebirth. That's the Holy of Holies within you. You got to have that first. And then you start building the walls around it. That's exactly what happened here. They first, they finished the temple. Then Nehemiah is sent and they start rebuilding the walls. But so if you can picture this, the temple has been finished, priests have been established. They're supposed to, the law of Moses was read by Ezra. They know what to do. They're, they're doing it. 
but they're they're not doing it from the heart they're not doing it from a motivation that uh, of honor that pleases god and that's why god raises up the prophet malachi malachi it's like i'm going to i'm going to give you one more warning it's like the final warning the final call i'm going to give you i'm going to send you my prophet and he's going to give you a warning if you'll heed this warning then i can bless your bless your land but as you know they didn't they didn't heed the warning and what's what's amazing in malachi chapter 3 the lord even mentions the messenger who would come before the lord and so the book of malachi ends part of that prophecy i'm going to send this messenger to prepare the way of the lord and then after the book of malachi there is not another prophet in israel the voice there's not not god speaking through a prophet there's not another one for about 400 years and the next voice of a prophet that is heard in israel is one crying in the wilderness prepare ye the way of the lord john the baptist it, it's like bookends <laughs> the prophet malachi is the last prophet it says there's one coming who will be the messenger prepare the way of the lord and right after him the lord will suddenly come to his temple and then you have 400 years and then you have john the baptist prepare ye the way of the lord and suddenly the lord comes to his temple and boy does he clean house when he does anyway whew, can't get into all of that it gets me excited though <laughs> all right so let me just i'm going to stay with my notes somewhat today because uh, there, there's a lot to say i'm going to take my time i don't know how long it's going to take to get through the book of malachi i'm not even sure if he's going to let me do them you know line upon line uh, for the next several services i just don't know we'll see i'm not in charge here <laughs> so let me just read this my how i started it off in the book of malachi the lord was not pleased that they were bringing blind sick and sometimes even stolen sheep to be offered for the sacrifice can you believe <laughs> after 70 years of bondage and now god has graciously allowed you to rebuild your temple let you go back to your homeland rebuild the temple and he, here's how you honor him you honor him oh i'm oh it's time for sacrifice i know i'm supposed to bring my best one but you know anything will do oh there's that one that got run over by the ox cart the other day it's got two broken legs and blind and not worth anything and yeah we'll just offer that this is the attitude of heart that God's rebuking here. See, it starts off in this. The part we're going to read here today is, Where is my honor? That is the question is that the Lord is asking all through the book of Malachi. This is the last prophet of the Old Testament, giving the nation its final chance to repent and honor God. Now for today, let's just pick it up in Malachi chapter, uh, chapter 1. And I'm going to read a fairly long passage here, uh, 6 through 14. It's good sometimes to just hear the word of God. A son honoreth his father, and a servant his master. If then I be a father, where is mine honor? Now let me just stop for a moment. That, that is the issue through the whole book of Malachi. Where is my honor? They were going through the motions like many church people do today. Yes, we, it's, oh, it's Sunday morning. We got to go to church. Or we got to pay our tithes. We got to, we got to sing worship songs and we got to dress up. We got to, you know, what, whatever. And listen, God loves it when his people assemble to love him, worship him, love each other, fellowship together. He loves genuine Christian things, but not when it's just done. As a matter of, I got to do this. My heart's not in it, but I got to, oh, it's Sunday. I guess I got to go to church. Uh, anyway, the whole book, if you'll keep that in mind, the book of Malachi will open up to you. Where is my honor? The whole book is about honoring God. Okay. So picking it up again, he says, If then I be a father, where is mine honor? And if I be a master, 
Where is my fear, saith the Lord of hosts unto you, O priests that despise my name? Now notice, this mainly is directed at the priests. The priests are supposed to be the leaders. It'd be like the ministry today were supposed to be the leaders. Anyway, don't want to get too far ahead of myself. He, he says, you priests that despise my name. That's pretty strong language. And, and so the priests would say, well, wherein have we despised thy name? He says, you offer polluted bread upon mine altar. And you say, wherein have we polluted thee? In that you say, the table of the Lord is contemptible. In other words, they don't like offering these sacrifices. They're just doing it because they have to. Verse 8, And if you offer the blind for sacrifice, is it not evil? And if you offer the lame and the sick, is it not evil? He says, Offer this to your governor. In other words, to a, your local politician, you know trying to gain favor with your local politician, offer one of these to him. Take him your blind, broken leg sheep. <laughs> you know? Will he be pleased with thee or accept thy person? Saith the Lord of hosts. And now I pray you, beseech God that he will be gracious unto us. He said, this has been by your means. Will he regard your persons? Saith the Lord of hosts. I love verse 10 there. Listen to this. Who is there even among you that would shut the doors for naught? Neither do you kindle fire on mine altar for naught. I have no pleasure in you, saith the Lord of hosts. Neither will I accept an offering at your hand. Now that, that whole passage is a little King Jamesy. Plain talk. He's saying, I wish one of you would just shut the doors to the temple. Just shut it. If that's the way you're, if, if you're just bringing an offering because you have to. And you're not going to honor me by bringing you your bringing your best, and and if you're just doing it because you don't want to go into bondage again, and and it, it, it's you know it's contemptible. We hate having to do this. See, a lot of people give their offerings that way. I always tell them, if there's nothing in you wants to give it, just keep it. He's not receiving it anyway. Did you hear what he said there? I wish you'd just shut the door. I'm not receiving these set, these offerings from you anyhow. Now, you can project that to the New Testament pretty easy. Anyone that rings an offering out of you with threats, well, man, we're all, I'm getting way ahead of myself, but if, if you're only giving because you have to and it's contemptible, nothing in you wants to do it, but I got to do it because I want to be blessed, God's not receiving that anyway. You might as well just keep it. Just keep it. <laughs> anyway, we'll, we'll get there later. <laughs> I'm going to read that verse again. Who is there even among you that would shut, just shut the doors? <laughs> he said, I'd rather you just shut the door. Don't bring anything. If you're going to bring it like that, just don't bring, shut the doors. Don't let them bring this stuff. If there's nothing in your heart that wants to honor me when you give it, don't bring it. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, that'll, that'll get you. That kind of preaching there gets you uninvited to minister at a lot of churches. <laughs> You're cursed with a curse. Oh, I can't. Oh, nope. Oop, sorry. Let it slip out a little bit. <laughs> we'll get there. We'll get there line upon line. We'll get there. <laughs> Verse 11. For from the rising of the sun, even unto the going down of the same, my name shall be great among the Gentiles. And in every place incense shall be offered unto my name, and a pure offering. A pure offering. Do you remember Jesus? Again, I can't help it. I'm getting way ahead of myself. You remember when Jesus said, if you have ought against your brother, when you come to bring an offering to God, he says, don't, don't, don't give your offering in that situation. First, go make it right with your brother. You know, the Bible says, as, as far as is possible with you, live at peace with all men. Well, if you're the one at fault, at fault and there's strife between you and your brother, you need to go and make it right, you know. Then come and give your offering to God. It's a pure offering, not something out of religious duty, not something because you have to or, or else. No. He, he, well, we'll you, you'll see it more and more as we go through the book of Malachi. Where is my honor? There is no honor to God 
out of a gift wrung out of you, or you're going to bribe God so that you don't have to forgive your neighbor, or you're going to bribe God so that you don't have to repent yourself if you're the one at fault. You're not ever going to bribe God. He doesn't need your money in the first place. <laughs> okay, But he, he wants a pure offering from the heart, prompt to do it, because you love to do it, and you love Him, and you love people, and you love the, the, the work of the ministry to get people saved. That's a pure offering, pure offering. Live at peace with all men. Okay, getting way ahead again. Verse 12. But you have profaned it in that you say, now again, this is the priest he's mainly talking to, well, the table of the Lord is polluted and the fruit thereof. Even his meat is contemptible. You said also, behold, what a weariness is it and you have snuffed at it saith the Lord of hosts before I go on now boy if I mean if that's not legalistic church oh it's Sunday I gotta dress up gotta go to church there's nothing nothing in me really wants to go I just gotta do it because it's Sunday and I, you know I don't want God to be mad at me and it, I mean all, you know, oh, it's offering time. I got to give into the offering, or else I'll be cursed. You know, and I want to be blessed. And but there's nothing really in me anyway that wants to do it. I, I, I'd, I'd, I'd keep it otherwise. Listen, there is no honor to God in giving like that or going to church like that. This is a hard issue. The whole question of Malachi, God's going. Where is my honor? Where is my honor? We'll get to it here. Oh, man, I love the book of Malachi. <laughs> I want to read to verse 13 again and then 14. <laughs> you said also, Behold, what a weariness is it. And you have snuffed at it, saith the Lord of hosts. And you brought that which was torn and the lame and the sick. When it says torn, if you look that up, it means by violence. And it can mean two things. Torn can mean torn away from your neighbor by stealth. You actually offer a stolen sheep. I don't want to give one of mine. Ah, one of my neighbor's sheep got through the fence and is over in my yard. Oh, I'll just offer my neighbor's sheep. It won't cost me anything. That's one way, of it, one interpretation of the word torn. But the other interpretation would be like roadkill or something that got uh, run over uh, by an ox cart or something and it's got two broken legs maybe it's alive but it, it's not worth anything anymore and it's oh we'll just we'll just offer that one that you know it's not it, it has no value really but I got to offer something so I'll just offer this one oh, man you would think they would have learned their lesson <laughs> thus you brought an offering now here it is remember this for later on in this lesson you're bringing a blind or wounded or sick or roadkill or a stolen sheep. The point is you're bringing something that has no value. You're doing it because you have to. You're hoping to squeak by just by legalism. Oh, I, I, he said, bring an offering. I brought one. <laughs> you know. Should I accept this? from your hand God's going should I accept you think I should accept this this is your offering you think I should blind broken legs uh, roadkill stolen you brought me a stolen lamb <laughs> uh, shall I accept this of your hand verse 14 I remember we're under the old covenant but cursed be the deceiver which hath in his flock a male. In other words, you've got a good one. And, and you make the vow. And sacrifice unto the Lord, though, a corrupt thing, a worthless thing, a stolen thing, a broken thing. He says, you've got the right one. You've got the right one to bring. But you don't bring that. You bring me something else instead. For I am a great king, saith the Lord of hosts. And my name is dreadful among the heathen. Whew. 
What a passage. Now I'm going to stay with my notes somewhat here because I want to make sure I include everything. <laughs> Sometimes I run off on tangents and then after the, after the recording I went, ah, I never mentioned that. Well, <laughs> Why was it so important to God that they bring their very best lamb to be offered as a sacrifice? If you want to look it up sometime in the Hebrew, one of the passages in, in the Old Testament when it's trying, you, you know, you got to decide, you got a whole bunch of lambs here or goats or whatever it is, and it's time for the right offering. And you're looking, now which one? What, in, in one of the verses, and I didn't look it up, but the, you know, the implication is, oh, it's, it's, the, it's the one you hand feed. It's your pet. It's the one you have the most affection for. The one that's spotless, the, the very best one you have, and the one you have the most affection. Hand feed, that tells you a lot, doesn't it? The one you hand feed, offer that one. Why? Because all of those offerings were pointing to the day when God would offer His Son, the very Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He didn't want them bringing an offering that cost them nothing because it was pointing to the day when it would cost heaven everything to offer Jesus on the altar. Where is my honor? I don't know how much of that they understood, but God made it real clear to them. He was trying to teach them about what was coming, that the Redeemer, the Lamb of God that was coming, would sure cost the Father. Talk about the one you hand fed, Ed. I mean, I don't think the Father hand fed Jesus, but the one you had the most affection for, the darling of heaven. I, I sometimes wonder what the angels thought when they saw him on the cross, when they saw him being scourged by the Roman soldiers to where he, he looked more like a piece of meat than he did a human being. It said, Isaiah, when he saw it in the spirit, he said, I, this, he's, he's marred. He's, he's been whipped and he, he doesn't even look like a man anymore. It's hard to tell what he is. Is that a deer? No, it's a man. The offering God was going to give would sure cost him. It sure would cost the son. And all of these offerings, God never, God in Hebrews, he, he doesn't delight. God loves every one of those sheep, even the little broken ones, the blind ones. I mean, if God just has his way, he just heal all of them, you know. But, that, but the lesson he was trying to teach them, remember the the law was given to point us to the fact we needed a Savior. It was our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. And all of that instruction about bring your best, bring the one you hand feed, bring the one that's spotless and without blemish, bring the very best one, it will cost you something to offer it. And God's teaching them the offering He's going to give would sure cost Him. He was honoring mankind, if you'll allow me by giving his very best. Now he's saying, where is my honor? Where is my honor? It's, and again, I have to keep coming. A big part of this is they weren't thankful. They weren't, they, it's like they hadn't learned anything. Here God, by his grace and mercy, is restoring them to the land, giving them permission from the, even the secular rulers to rebuild the temple, to rebuild the temple. They're given a, a sec, and they've rebuilt it, even though there was a lot of opposition and delays, but they got it built. But now that it's built, and they're, they're in the process of rebuilding the walls, what is the attitude of heart? Are they thankful? No. They're just going through the motions, like many, I hate to say it, many, many, many Christians today especially in the USA, just going through the motions. Oh, it's Sunday. Got to go to church. Oh, it's Wednesday night. Uh, Got to go to church. Time for the offering. Oh, on and on and on. 
Where is my honor? Where is my honor? <laughs> I'm going to read it again. <laughs> Sorry. No, I'm not. <laughs> Why was it so important to God that they bring their very best to be offered as a sacrifice? It was pointing to the day when the Father would offer the very best He had. His only begotten Son as the Lamb of God who would take away the sin of the world. Excuse me while I turn the page here. To bring a crippled or a sick or even a stolen lamb or roadkill <laughs> would greatly cheapen and dishonor the future sacrifice of the Son of God. Of course, today we don't offer animals, do we? Can you imagine? I've actually... Well, uh, that's a rabbit trail. Can you imagine the, the sacrilege after Jesus, as the Lamb of God, has shed His blood once and for all for all mankind? Can you imagine the dishonor, the sacrilege of saying, oh, I sinned. I'm going to go bring a lamb. I'm going to go get a, a lamb today after Jesus has sacrificed his blood. And you're going to offer the, the blood of an animal? Like on the same altar where Jesus' blood already is? <laughs> no. See, we don't. Is it, no, no, no. No, the, that was all, that was type and shadow pointing to the day when the Lamb of God would shed His blood. We wouldn't think, although I have, the rabbit trail is, I've actually heard of churches that got so uh, messed up, let's say it, that would be nice, that they've actually gone back to animal sacrifice. You talk about not understanding the New Covenant at all, or even the Old Covenant pointing to the New Covenant. I mean, that's... I'd, that hey, that's ignorance before daylight. But anyway, <laughs> so let me just read this. Of course, we don't offer animals, the blood of animals, on the altar today. The blood of Jesus has already been shed. It will never be called to be the Lamb of God. There was only one of those. Trust me, you're not qualified anyway. And the blood's already been offered. So, I, in the early days, when I was meditating Malachi, and I was trying to, you know, just like Dave teaches, just assimilate the book and pray. Assimilate, read it again, the whole book, pray, read it again, pray, read it again, pray. 30 times, 40 times, 50 times, lose track after 50. I don't, I quit putting the little X's there, you know, in my Bible, how many times are little marks, you know. And finally one day, good, I kept going, what, what? How do, we, how do we live this out today as New Testament creatures, New Testament beings, sons of the living God, sons and daughters of the living God? How, how do we live this out today? We don't bring animals to be sacrificed. And I know we need to have the right attitude of heart and, and, and you know do everything we do joyfully as unto the Lord. But specifically, what about these animals? We don't, we don't bring animals. I don't know how long it was, but boy, one day, bam. <laughs> and I'm telling you, when the Holy Ghost gives you an understanding, it's usually so simple. You think, how could I not have seen that, you know? And it's also, it'll just, it's like a running stream. I mean, when you get it, you don't have to pound any square pegs into any round holes. I mean, oh, you get it and just runs like from Genesis to maps. <laughs> it's just bam, you go, oh my God, that's it, that's it. So I was meditating on, and you know, what would be the modern day equivalent of honoring God by offering our best to Him as a sacrifice? And bam, it dropped into my spirit. If you don't it already there, turn to Romans 12, verse 1. There is a sacrifice we're to offer all right. And we're told very specifically how to bring it and what kind it is supposed to be just like the instructions they had in the Old Testament. <laughs> Look at Romans 12, verse 1. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your, not a lamb, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, 
Now notice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And I went, oh my God. <laughs> my body? I've definitely hand-fed this body. <laughs> I've definitely hand-fed it. <laughs> <laughs> and I've probably fed, uh, not probably, I've fed it a lot of things that don't honor God. You know? <laughs> I don't want to mention your favorite thing. I, at the conference recently, I mentioned potato chips, just trying to pick something, you know, that I knew wasn't real healthy. Sure enough, <laughs> somebody, now you're after my bowls of potato chips, but they did it lovingly. It was funny. <laughs> <laughs> I could have mentioned anything, you know, in, in Cheetos, Fritos, uh, <laughs> corn dogs. <laughs> Just name something. Talk about your pet. What? My body? <laughs> okay, let's don't go past this verse too quick. Because this is the modern day equivalent. I'm going to pick on me and be nice to you. One of the ways you offer your bodies in the New Testament is, f f just a minute, I'll get it out. F f there's a word I'm trying to say. Begin. It's f I f fasting. I said it. I said it. One of the ways we're to offer our bodies in the New Testament is through fasting. And I don't. I didn't even put that scripture on here today. But Matthew chapter nine. The disciples of John had come, and other places, but Matthew chapter 9, the disciples of John the Baptist came to Jesus, and they said, you know, we've noticed something. The Pharisees, their disciples fast. We're the disciples of John, and we fast. But we've been watching you, and you, I mean, your disciples anyway. We've been watching your disciples, and we notice they don't fast. Why is that? Well, and Jesus gives them quite a bit of explanation, which I'm sure they probably didn't understand about the wine skin and, and uh, that type of thing, you know. But he says, as long as the bridegroom is with them, talking about himself, as long as I'm here, they really don't need to fast. See, because they were living under his mantle anyway. They don't need to fast. But the days will come when the bridegroom is taken away. And of course, that's speaking of today. He himself is not on planet earth. We're told real clearly, he himself in his glorified body is seated at the right hand of the Father in heaven. So this is that day. But he says, in that day, when the bridegroom shall be taken away, then, then shall they fast. I remember when that verse came alive in me after so many years of day faithfully, lovingly, but relentlessly teaching us to fast. And I still never did hardly enough of it to fill a thimble full. Why? I don't like it. <laughs> I don't like going hungry. Uh, but this is my hand-fed offering here. <laughs> This is my body. Are you kidding? I, I hand feed this thing. It's my pet. <laughs> my, my body, you know. <laughs> I hope I'm making the point. But I remember when that verse went off in me. Because he's plainly saying about our covenant. In these days, when the bridegroom is not on planet earth. In these days, he's saying, my disciples shall fast. Oh, it went through me like a, like a ton of bricks. It's just like, Wow. And I remember saying something like this. I said, Lord, for all these many years, I have been calling myself your disciple, a disciple of yours. Lord, I haven't fasted enough to fill a thimble full, just the bare minimum. Lord, that stops today with your help. By your, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I don't remember what all I said exactly, but I'm going to do more fasting. And I have, and I've done more since that day. Now still, I haven't, I haven't done a 40-day like many of my brethren have. And I don't want to mention names, but many of the ministers you listen to have done that. But I've done longer and longer fasts. And I've done enough to get past the first three days. If you ever do any real, you know, serious fasting beyond a day or so, you'll find that that hunger, roughly the, somewhere between the third and fourth day, will just go away. And there's a reason for that, in which I'm not teaching on fasting today, but... Basically, you're, you're, by the end of three or four days, your body has burned up the, 
the sucralose, the sugar, from what you've been eating. That's why you feel hungry. It's wanting more. But it switches at that point because you've burned it all up. You've used it. And now you, your body switches automatically into what's called ketosis. And instead of burning sugar foods, sucralose, now it starts burning fat. And, ah, in Gary's case, well, we have an abundance of that now, don't we? So <laughs> when the body switches to ketosis and starts burning the fat, there's a satisfaction to it. It's got food. It's just not what you're eating now. It's what you've stored. But the, the hunger pains go away. And really fasting from that point on, the, the only problem is really a mental thing like, oh, it, it's, it's noon. I should be having lunch. You know, it's not really hunger pains. It's more a memory thing. But you get past that pretty quick. And boy, once you've spent a little time in, in that area, a few days, uh, it, I'm telling you, there is a quietness that comes. I heard Pastor Bronk recently say, in that time period, after the hunger pains are over, you can hear a pin drop in the spirit. <laughs> Pastor Dave would say it's like a, a pond within you. On a, you ever been at a pond on a really still day where there's not a breath of air? And it's just like glass, you know. You could take the tiniest pebble and throw it in there and boy, you'll notice it right off. Because that, that's the way you become. You become so quiet and it's easier to hear God. And that's... That's why Dave says, we don't fast in order that our voice will be heard on high. We fast so that his voice will be heard on low. Man, you get quiet, you get still, you know, be still and know that I am God. And you remember when Elijah went to the cave and first there was, a, I forget it, I mean, I have it in sequence, but there was wind and, and the earthquake and the rock shook, but the Lord wasn't in any of that. But after all that was over, that's like the first three days. <laughs> oh God, it's an earthquake. No, you're just... <laughs> first three days are like the wind and the rocks and the... Ah, it's an earthquake. But see, after that stopped, ah, then there was a still small voice. And that was the voice of God. And boy, Dave was so right. Pastor Dave Roberson. When you fast and get to that quiet place, it makes it really easy to hear his voice on low. Fasting is one way that you can offer your body a living sacrifice. But let me mention this, because the Word of God is so precise, so accurate, always. Let's go through Romans 12, 1, just a little more. Dad Hagen used to say, when you find the word therefore, be sure you understand what it's there for. So when Paul says, I beseech you therefore, what he's saying is based on everything that I have said to you in this book of Romans for the first 11 chapters. Boy, there's a lot in the first 11 chapters of the book of Romans. Oh my goodness. It's the whole plan of God of salvation. Notice it says, and by the mercies of God in that first 11 chapters, the Holy Spirit through the Apostle Paul gave us a Rembrandt, a Picasso, a most eloquent understanding of the gospel of Jesus Christ and what it truly means to be saved. Many have said that they think the book of Romans is the pinnacle of teaching. That the, that the Holy Spirit has given man through anybody. But I beseech you, therefore, beseech you, if you look that word up, it's, it's like he's, Paul is down on one knee, almost begging. He, he, for 11 chapters, he has laid out the mercies of God and what all he is. See, that's the thing that's so different about Christianity from any religion. Christianity is not a religion. It's a family. That's why you can't join it. You have to be born into it. But it's different from all the religions of the world. All the religions of the world focus on what man must do for God. But Christianity is completely different. The message of Christianity is what God has done for man. Man couldn't save himself. There's nothing man could do to even approach God. The, the gulf was too great. The great gulf 
Pastor Dave would say, we'd come up to the edge of that gulf and look, can I, can I throw money across? Can I throw good works across? Can I, is there any, what can I do? And there's nothing man could do to bridge the gap. Nothing, nothing, nothing. So God from his side sent his son to pay the price we couldn't pay, to bridge the gap that we couldn't cross, to make a way. That's why Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father by, but by me. Jesus is the only way to the Father. No, other, no religion can bridge that gap that exists between man and God. God had to do it from his side. God, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. It's an amazing the love of God. Amazing the love of God. Oh, just want to preach the gospel right there. Tears come to my eyes. It's been 40 some odd years and still the, the miracle of salvation just overwhelms me. The, the majesty of his love, the greatness of how for the most vile sinner, he loves us anyway. And he, he made a way for us to be saved. Oh, thank God for the gospel. And he says, again, we're still in Romans 12. <laughs> I'm, I'm begging you, Paul says, based on everything that I've written, everything God has done by His mercy, everything He's done for us. Now, now that He's done that, there's something we can do. There's something God needs from us. That you present your bodies. Our bodies are the lamb that we're to bring. It's the sacrifice that we're to offer. And it's, but notice, you can't just, just like in the Old Testament, just like in Malachi, God would not receive these broken, <laughs> sick, stolen, whatever, worthless offerings. What are we told next, next here? Present your bodies a living sacrifice. Now, what's that next word? Holy. Holy. And then notice the next word, acceptable unto God. Let me ask you, in Malachi, if they brought these worthless, broken, did God accept them? He said, I'd rather you'd shut the door. No, they're not acceptable. I will not receive them from you. I won't. I won't, re I won't receive it. And yet he's telling us, not only see our spirits are holy because of what he did. Our spirit is made and right. You can read it in Ephesians four, right after verse twenty, that when we're born again, we are created, and I mean instantly from the get go, we are created in righteousness and true holiness. But he's talking about our spirit, see, and he's not talking about you bringing your spirit. <laughs> your spirit, he made it holy. Your body, you make it holy. Did you hear that? <laughs> you got to bring it holy. You're the one. You, the Ephesians, what's it talking about? Put off the old man, put on the new man. And in Galatians, he says, if we live in the spirit, let us also walk in the spirit. So you got all of that stuff listed there, works of the flesh. And it starts off with adultery and fornication. And in there is murder and witchcraft and all of this stuff. No, no, no. We crucify that. We, we crucify the flesh with all of that. It's warning of all that stuff. You do it by the power of the new nature. By Really, it's Christ in you coming to maturity. If you want to know the truth of it, <laughs> see, holiness is a fruit of maturity. It really is. Let me ask you this. Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. Now, we've taught many times, even though Jesus is God in the flesh, he laid aside his... Now, he was divine the whole time, but what he laid aside was his access to his divinity. He didn't, he, didn't, uh, he didn't do anything because he was God. He did everything because he was a man born of God's Spirit and anointed by the Holy Ghost. Why? So he would be the pattern for us. And that's exactly what Hebrews 12 says, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. He is the man that we look to who is born of, God, born of God, just like you are if you're born again, 
and anointed by the Holy Ghost, just like you are if you've received the baptism in the Holy Ghost. Well, what did he do with his body? Oh, well, he was tempted in every point, yet without sin. He has put his spirit on the inside of us. And as it comes to maturity, you see, really, Romans 12, 1 is a maturity verse. As your, the next verse talks about the renewing of the mind. And as your mind is renewed, it thinks like Jesus. And Jesus went, well, I'm tempted, but I'm not going to do that because I'm a, I'm a son of God. That, that wouldn't please God. I'm, I'm not going to do that. Oh, my goodness. Praise God. Praise God. Hallelujah. I thank you, Lord. Oh, my God. Even those of you that are still fighting with addictions, know this, my spirit within you is stronger than anything that your flesh is addicted to. Call upon my name. Call upon my name. Learn who you are. Allow my spirit to mature you. Let the seed of Christ in you come to maturity. And as he does, you will find his strength in your ability to lay down anything that would addict your flesh. Speak against, call your, speak against all addictions. Rebuke any voice that says you are an addict. You are a son, a daughter of the living God, and whom the Son makes free is free indeed. Glory to God. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Woo. Hallelujah. See, and I'm, I'm a guy that's... When I hear that, I go... I mean, I'm, I'm still maturing right along with you guys. You know that. But I look, I look at what he's pruned already... <laughs> I used to be addicted to cigarettes. I used to be addicted to pornography. I used to be addicted to alcohol. I can relate. I used to be addicted to money. <laughs> oh yeah, you can be addicted always your whole life. I remember what it was like. It's always, always, how are we going to live in a better house? How are we going to have a bigger car? How are we going to have land here and land there and vacation homes? And it just never ends. It never ends. And Thank God I was delivered from that. Thank God. That took a little while. <laughs> and I like nice things. Don't get me wrong. I like, I, you know, I like nice things like anybody. But boy, I don't live for those things anymore. Listen, he has made you free already. He really has. Now that, that freedom, you say, well, I don't feel it. Keep praying. Keep staying in the word of God. Keep worshiping. Add a little f f fasting. <laughs> Dave says, if you want to kick in the afterburners, turn up the prayer and the fasting. They are the power twins. <laughs> and I, I found that to be true. You, you're going to be free of it. I don't care if you're what you're addicted to today. He's already made you free. Maturity will cause that to be lopped off of you. Remember I did some message recently with God comes with those loppers. He'll lop off. He, as you mature, as you mature, I mean, you're already bearing fruit, but as you mature, he's going to come. And when I say, if you'll keep praying, keep meditating, keep fasting, doing worship, doing all of those things, you mature. You, see, the next verse says, be not, be, be not conformed to this world, but be you transformed. How? By the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Well, see, what it's talking about there, your mind becomes the mind of Christ. You're growing up as a son. You, you start thinking like Christ. Well, how did he think about his body? He loved his body. No man, the Bible says, no man ever yet hated his own body, but nourishes and cherishes it even as the Lord does the, the, the church. So Jesus had a, had a flesh and bone body, and it says he was tempted in every point just like we are yet without sin. Well, how did he do that? He was fully mature. He, he, he understood, no, no, I feel that temptation, but I'm not doing that. It wouldn't honor God. I don't do that. I'm a son of God. I'm, I'm righteous. I don't do that. You know, it says he was tempted in every point like we are, yet without sin. Well, as you, as you mature Christ in you, you know, he says uh, the seed when it's sown is, is like the smallest seed in the earth. 
but it's really it's 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 uh, it, remember how the mustard seed starts off as the little grain of looks like a grain of pepper but the kind they grow in Israel when that thing comes to full harvest full maturity well it's 15 feet tall it's a tree the birds can come and and lodge in the branches of it you know now that's the way Christ in you is as you do all of these things that, that he's given us the prayer the fasting the worship and meditation of the word all of those things nurture that seed of Christ and you start coming to maturity and everybody still feels temptations at time at least I still do and I'm 76 by the way some things don't tempt me anymore you know you can retrain your body at least in certain areas my body used to crave nicotine so bad I thought it was going to kill me if I didn't give it nicotine I really did and boy that was a battle royal but I've been free of that stuff so long now. I mean I used to love the smell of smoke so much I would in the days when I was trying to get free of it I would somebody walk by smoke it I'd want to turn and follow them just to be in the trail of that smoke you know? now it's the most disgusting thing I can't even think of smoking a cigarette today it's see what I'm saying is you can retrain the body on at least certain things maybe everything I don't know but at least on certain things where it's repulsive to you don't you, you don't want that. it's not even a temptation anymore but other things still are what are they they're none yet they're none of your business I'm not asking about your things <laughs> okay pie there's certain kinds of pie <laughs> certain kinds of ice cream <laughs> okay okay <laughs> still nope nope <laughs> can't I'm not allowed to eat in a whole cart of a whole carton of ice cream <laughs> no <laughs> okay okay I digress okay let's get back to the lesson but it, it is a maturity thing see it's as you grow and you're able as as your mind is renewed to think like the original to think like Christ his mind becomes your mind and even though you might be tempted you go no I don't do that I, I'm, I'm a child of God I, I am righteousness with legs <laughs> I present my body unto the Lord holy well let's don't miss that holy it's got everything to do with the revival now he's not reward like see Peter said after after the Lord used him to heal the lame man that was born crippled from his mother's womb that's a birth defect and after the miracle happened then everybody's looking at Peter and John you know like it's you and he's going well why look you on us like by our own power or our own holiness See, you don't earn anything because oh I'm presenting my body holy no he just said that's your reasonable service and it's really a maturity thing Jesus presented his holy so the father could freely work through the body a little harsher so the father would accept his body as a sacrifice that the father could flow through I'm gonna look at it again put, put your nose right there Romans 12 1 look at it again I beseech you therefore brethren by the mercies of God based on everything that God has done for us that you Malachitans <laughs> present your bodies a living sacrifice not because we have to not with the attitude of the Malachites not with oh I gotta say this is Gary I'm can't be mean to me nice to you oh I don't want to fast oh I don't want to fast I hate fasting why did you have to put fasting in there <laughs> and I have to admit I'm still partly that way <laughs> but I'm growing I'm maturing it's not like it used to be I'm not saying I'm wholly completely there but I do this attitude keeps changing in me it's like I, Lord my body doesn't like fasting but I do I, me your real son I know I have to keep this body under dominion you know Paul even said about himself now this is the Apostle Paul he said he he even after he has established churches and everything that he had done he says he had to keep his body under he still had to keep it under if he didn't he said he was in danger himself of being a castaway and that's the same Greek word translated reprobate in Romans chapter 1 Paul had to keep his body under so my attitude I think I'm maturing 
Father, this body is a sacrifice to you. It's my hand-fed one. I really love this body. If anything hurts it, <laughs> I'm really sensitive to that. If I you know, smash your finger with a hammer or anything like that, we love and cherish and nourish our bodies. It's my hand-fed one, Lord, but I'm offering it to you. And I'm offering it holy. I'm offering it holy. See, that's, that's how Jesus did it. He continually offered his body holy unto the Lord. So the next word is acceptable. Let's say it this way. He would offer his body, his physical body, to the Father holy. Why? So the Father would accept it. And did he ever? <laughs> did he ever accept it? We're told to grow up, have our mind renewed, think like Jesus. Think like a mature child of God. You go, well, my body doesn't like it, but I do. The real me does. Because it enables me, by fasting I'm talking, that's one of the tools to help me keep this thing holy. Because this thing ain't saved. <laughs> you know your body's not saved, right? You're supposed to count it dead. Well, fasting is one of the ways you enforce that. Say, uh, fasting's not pleasant to my body. My body sure doesn't like it, but I do. I do. Because it's a tool you gave me to help me keep this body under. Now, there's another one, too. Because really, if you, you remember, therefore, based on everything I've said, well, he's already said in Romans chapter 8 about the Holy Spirit, who also helps us with our infirmities, the very thing we're talking about. Let me say it a different way. Who also helps us keep our bodies holy and so we don't yield to temptation. Well, how does he do that? With groanings that can't be uttered because we don't even know what's wrong with us. We don't know how to pray as we ought, but the Holy Spirit, he makes intercession for us according to the will of God. He knows everything about you. He knows exactly everything that needs to change. So not only does... Do we, do we have the power of the new nature? I want to say the power of Christ in us to keep our bodies holy. But the Holy Spirit also helps us. So it's not just fasting. It's spending lots of time praying in other tongues. So allow the Holy Spirit to pray because he, he knows everything about you. He knows the plan of God for your life. We don't even know how to pray. We don't know what to pray a lot of times. But the Holy Spirit does. And He will make intercession for you according to the will of God. So that's another way. See, every time you, you decide, okay, I'm not going to watch television the next two hours. I'm going to pray. I'm going to give myself to prayer for the next two hours. Do you know right then you're offering your body a living sacrifice? I remember the early days when I was at the ugly building and, and I, you know, I had almost no distractions, had no telephone, no TV, no visitors hardly, just there. So many, you know, six to eight hours, sometimes during, right before conference, 12 hours a day. Pray, pray, pray until you thought your lips were going to roll off on the floor. Boy, did my body not like that. <laughs> I mean, I would have to walk in those days and just give my body something to do. And I'd walk back and forth and back and forth. I'd like, you know, good thing it was concrete floor. I'd ward a hole in the carpet. <laughs> My body would say, hey, let's, let's go mow the lawn. And I knew that had to be the flesh because normally I don't like mowing the lawn. <laughs> but my flesh would just want, let me do something. Let me do something. But when you pray, when you just, we're going to offer ourselves for the next two hours. Body, you're going you're gonna to just be nice. And we're going to offer ourselves in prayer. Throw in a little fasting. Maybe read your word while you're praying and fasting. You've really kicked in the power now. That's a good start on Malachi. See you again next time. Bye-bye.